Hi everyone, welcome to the final session of today's Quantum Tech presentations. Um, I'm delighted to have with me Andy Edmonds, who's Principal Scientist and part of the R&D team at Element 6's Global Innovation Centre in Harwell. That's in the UK. Uh, he's uh, over 15 years of experience of diamond defect physics and synthesis uh, across both academia and industry. Uh, he joined Element 6 in 2013 and is currently working on projects focusing on optimization of CVD diamond synthesis for quantum sensing applications uh, and the further development of characterization techniques. Uh, so with that, uh, Andy, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Amit, for the very kind introduction. So as previously introduced, my name's Andrew Edmonds from Element 6. And what I'm going to do today uh, with you is give you a flavour of some of the work that myself and my colleagues, who I list here, some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years to really transform Diamond into an engineered solution for, given the topic today, quantum sensing uh, technologies. And I want to thank also the previous speakers um, in the sessions today for their very uh, interesting talks. So I'm conscious at the beginning of this talk that some of you might not know who Element 6 are as a company and what we are about. So we actually have a long history in, as part of the De Beers group of companies, and we date back all the way to 1946. So we've now been involved in diamond innovation for over 70 years. So essentially we take the unique properties of diamond and other supermaterials and try and deliver engineered solutions to a wide range of applications. And these applications are broadly spread across two uh, different themes. Firstly, we have the abrasive applications of diamond, which simply you look to use the the hardness of the material and in these applications we're essentially using cutting drilling grinding or polishing applications exploiting diamonds intrinsic hardness and then we have what we refer to as the technological applications which essentially look to use the properties of diamond that extend beyond simply the hardness of the material so traditionally one of our big application areas within technologies has actually been in optical. So what, what I have here is an optical window uh, made of diamond. You're gonna have to trust me that it's diamond and not a piece of glass, but the key, the key difference with diamond is that we have a optical transmission window in the case of diamond that extends from the UV into the far infrared. So that when you combine it with the fact that diamond has a very good thermal conductivity means diamond is an excellent material uh, for modern high power infrared uh, lasers. But given the topic uh, today, obviously I'm going to be focusing on the emerging quantum applications using uh, lab grown diamond. So, one of the reasons why diamond has become such a big uh, part of emerging quantum sensing technologies is because of a particular uh, defect or color center that we can find uh, within uh, special uh, diamonds. And this is the, the Nitrogen Vacancy Center, or for short, MV Center. Now, throughout the last few decades, there's been an awful lot of really beautiful experimental and theoretical work to really understand, to begin with, this defect, and then more and more in increasing years, actually utilizing the properties of this defect. Now, I don't need to go into too much depth on the the, the beautiful spin physics of this defect, but there are a few key points that I want to emphasize. So if we have this defect in the negative charge state, we have a, uh, a spin of one. Now, when we look at the spin state structure of this defect, we can spin polarize the ground state, i.e. create these defects in particular levels in the ground state by simply optically pumping this system uh, with a green LED or laser. One of the other critical factors of the MV center is we can actually encode which spin state we live in or read out the spin state that a particular defect is in by measuring the amount of luminescence that this uh, particular defect gives off. So that should be a difference depending on whether it's in one of the plus or minus one spin states 
or the zero spin state in the ground state. So we can optically spin, uh, optically read out the spin of the defects. What this means is we have an all optical scheme of initializing and reading out uh, this spin state. Furthermore, in the ground state, we can manipulate which uh, spin state a defect lives in uh, with microwaves. And the magic of the MV center in diamond is all of this is possible at room temperature. And because of the strong tetrahedral bonding structure of diamond, we intrinsically in pure diamond samples obtain a long coherence time. Now, one of the reasons why this particularly gained attention in the late 1990s was that people found with very, very back then rare diamond samples, you could actually perform um, fundamental experiments on single NV centers. So it's like having a, a single atom system at your disposal, but enclosed within a, a nice stable uh, solid state uh, material. But back then, as I mentioned, those samples were relatively rare. What was really needed for this community to grow further was a source of uh, this material on demand. Now, Element 6 has been working in the technologies of synthesizing diamond in the lab for decades. And our main technique that we use in this space is chemical vapor deposition or CBD. Now, CBD, as the name uh, suggests, involves a chemical reaction that occurs in the vapor phase above a substrate that causes deposition onto that uh, surface. Now, when we look at growing the best single crystal uh, diamond, and there's an example video that I'm highlighting here in the bottom left hand corner of this slide, our substrate itself is a diamond um, uh, substrate, and we are adding into the uh, reactor uh, a carbon source, which is typically methane and hydrogen. Now, these uh, molecules are dissociated by, in our case, a microwave plasma that sits within a custom designed uh, reactor. Now, hydrogen is a critical part of this process because it etches away uh, non-diamond phases as this diamond is growing up layer by layer. And there's a lot of levers at our disposal when we can optimize a CBD growth process. We can change the temperature of the growing uh, diamond to the surface of that growing diamond. We can change the power in the reactor, the pressure, all these things we have to concern ourselves with when we're trying to generate a, a specific uh, grade of diamond material. Now, one of the headline results from our work was uh, back in 2002 when we synthesized the first, what we refer to as electronic grade uh, diamond by this method. Now, what this essentially means is the purity of this uh, material is less than five parts per billion nitrogen. So that means uh, you need billions and billions of carbon atoms before you will find one impurity atom. So this is much, much purer than you'll find in nature, apart from in freak <laughs> samples. And it's interesting to note that actually some of the early experiments that went on with MV centers in diamond were actually performed on a natural diamond, but it was so rare that it was referred to as the magic Russian diamond. And I would encourage anybody interested in learning more about that to, to Google the term magic Russian diamond and watch a really nice uh, YouTube video that's been put together on that subject. So this material we made commercially available in 2007. And really what I want to emphasize in the next few slides is how the emergence of this material was really crucial in the wider uh, studying of this system and ultimately the, uh, the quantum diamond research that is now going on. So if we backtrack slightly and think about what we've made with electronic grade diamond, we can start thinking about what that means in terms of how many MV centers somebody might find in this material. So as a typical rule of thumb, for a range of nitrogen CVD material, we typically observe uh, a ratio of substitutional nitrogen defects to the negative MV defect, which is the defect and charge state that we're interested in, the ratio of around 300 to 1. So if we recall, we said that concentration in electronic grade diamond is typically around one part per billion. So what this means is in the volume of 10 by 10 by 5 microns, we would only expect about 30 at most negative MV centers. 
So what this means is if we have a, at our disposal, a confocal microscope, we can search around a bit and fairly readily find single uh, isolated negative MV centers. So instead of having to find a rare diamond sample, you can then uh, instead go and buy a sample where you can find these, new, these isolated MV centers. So what I show here is the uh, map over time of just how the number of academic groups and industrial people interested in this technology has really emerged over the last few years. And I actually need to update it because it stops at uh, 2017. But the other way that we can look at it is by simply the number of uh, papers, and journal articles there are in this space um, per year as a function of time. And what's again quite noticeable is where our development of electronic grade fits into this story. And really, this was crucial to supporting this explosion of interest in this system in Diamond. So we've really supported this sector in two ways. Firstly, by making this Diamond material available for the early researchers. And also, we ourselves have been involved in a lot of collaborative quantum related projects, again, since around 2007. So what we've talked about so far are essentially MV centers that we find that are accidentally incorporated in high purity uh, diamond, but we might instead, depending on the application, want to produce increased levels of MV in our material. And really the approach that we use depends on how much nitrogen we have in that starting material. So if, if we have a high purity material, such as electronic grade that I've previously introduced, we can use nitrogen implantation to increase the amount of nitrogen in that material. So essentially we can implant a single, if we want to, uh, nitrogen atoms into that substrate. Now the process of implantation also leads to vacancy production, essentially a little bit of damage around that, that nitrogen atom that we've implanted. We can then thermally anneal uh, the diamond at temperatures above which vacancies are mobile, which is typically above around 800 degrees C, and the vacancies will find a nearby nitrogen atom and form the MV that we're after. So with this technology, we can form MVs at chosen locations, but the MVs are only found close to the surface. Ultimately, an implanted nitrogen atom can only penetrate so deeply into a diamond substrate. So that's the low nitrogen case. If instead we want to create higher concentrations of MV that exists throughout the bulk of a diamond sample, we can take advantage of the ability within CBD to actually deliberately add back in a controlled uh, amount of nitrogen into the process. Then again, as before, we can use electron irradiation to produce vacancies, thermally anneal to produce NV, and throughout through this method, we can produce, if we want to, high concentrations of NV that exist throughout the sample, or alternatively, we can grow high nitrogen layers on top of the high purity substrate and then have uh, comparatively thin uh, homogeneous layers of MV in an otherwise high purity sample. So the early work that I discussed back then uh, concerning single MV centers was really concerned with fields such as quantum computation, the generation of single photon sources, etc. But what's really emerged over the last few years is that there are also other quantum based applications of diamond that are more around the sensing uh, domain. So one example, the main example I'm gonna focus on today is the idea of using MVs in diamond to measure a magnetic field. And we can do this by this uh, schematic that I show on the top left-hand side uh, of this slide using the electronic Zeeman interaction. So our plus and minus one spin levels in the ground state are split by the presence of a magnetic field that is along the MV axis of this particular MV defect. So then through, through the electronic Zeeman interaction, we observe a splitting in energy levels that is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field along that MV's uh, symmetry axis. And then using the principles that we've described before, we can understand that this experiment is actually relatively simple. All we have to do is scan the microwave uh, frequency that we're applying to this system, measure the amount of uh, light that's emitted by the diamond when we're pumping it with a green source, observe 
for a single MV case, the two resonance lines that we see in terms of a dip in luminescence measure that splitting. And then we have a direct calibration free way of measuring the magnetic field that is along that axis. Now, if instead of a single MV center, we think of an array of MV centers that are populating not just the one orientation that I illustrate in the schematic here, but the other four possible orientations, we will, see, we will observe a larger number of resonance lines corresponding to the magnetic field projected along all those different axes. So what we have at our disposal is actually a vector magnetometer that's all encapsulated within one diamond sample. So very powerful. And then what I show at the top here is really just making the point that to illustrate this effect is relatively simple in terms of the equipment that you need. You just need a, a, an intense source of green light, an LED or a laser, that you focus onto a diamond sample containing an ensemble of MV centers. We typically apply a known static magnetic field just to remove this initial degeneracy in the um, spin levels. So we can then measure small splittings on top of a known splitting. We need our microwave coil to deliver the microwave radiation, a filter to remove the green light, and then simply a photo detector to measure the amount of red light that is emitted. So what this means is that we and other companies have been able to put together very simple demonstration units with essentially commercial off the shelf components out of obviously a nicely engineered diamond sample that illustrates this effect. And we found this as a really powerful tool. It's much more uh, uh, impactful when we demonstrate this technology to a customer when we can actually show them a box that is demonstrating the principle rather than directing them to uh, a list of academic papers. So from our side of things at element six, what we really need to be concerned with is what we can do with the material to really optimize the sensitivity, say, of a magnetic field sensor. And our primary concern is obviously looking at the, the properties of the material itself that can influence uh, the sensitivity. So what I show at the top right hand corner of this slide is the, the fundamental equation that tells you the minimum magnetic field that you can detect uh, with an MV based sensor. And what I've done here is kick, pick out the key material related terms that we're um, concerned with. So the first one, the most simple one is simply the number of MVs that we're using uh, in this system. If we have a larger number of MVs that we use, so a larger ensemble of MVs, we'll observe more luminescence and a signal is more readily detected. The coherence time is also critical because what we've seen in this schematic shown again in the center of this slide is this idea that we see uh, two or uh, uh, groups of resonance lines and it's the, the sharpness of these resonance lines that's given by the coherence time. So a sharper resonance line makes it easier, easier for us to detect a small change in uh, magnetic field, so a more sensitive device. And then there's the, the concept of contrast in this device. Now it's important to remember that all the spin physics that we've discussed only works if our MV center is negatively charged. In reality, in the diamond sample, we'll observe both negatively charged, which is this spectrum I show in the bottom right in red, and neutrally charged MV sensors, which is the spectrum I show in blue. These spectra overlap. So essentially, if we don't engineer the diamond to contain a high fraction of MV minus compared to MV neutral, the MV neutral has the potential to swamp the uh, emission spectrum and erode the contrast that we're trying to measure in performing the measurement of magnetic field. So in practice, what this means when we produce a diamond sample for this sort of application, we need to concern ourselves with a whole host of material related uh, factors, such as the things that can fundamentally affect the coherence time, T2 star, which are things like the nitrogen that we've added into the, the material, the, and the amount of other parasitic, parasitic, uh, sorry, paramagnetic defects that can exist in that material. And we also have fundamental things like the, the size and shape of the diamond sample, which can influence how easy it is for us to 
injects the light into the, the diamond sample and then conversely collects the luminescence that we're interested in. The other fundamental question with, that we need to answer when we think about growing a diamond for this sort of application is how much MV do we want in this material? And really, there's different approaches that exist when optimizing the number of MV centers uh, used by a sensor. Firstly, we can increase the number of MV centers simply by increasing the area, so increasing the size of the piece of diamond that we're using at a fixed uh, MV minus concentration. Or alternatively, we can increase the MV minus concentration and keep the volume fixed, or obviously a combination of those two things. Now, these two different approaches are illustrated in this paper uh, from uh, Cleverson, where in the case of a low MV containing diamond, one potentially optimal scheme is to inject a laser into a facet along the side of the diamond sample and then let that laser bounce around multiple times within the diamond sample using total internal reflection. Now this only works in the case where we have a low concentration of MV uh, minus because in the high concentration case the MV itself will start to absorb the, the laser that we're using to excite the luminescence. So if instead we think about a, a high MV containing sample, it's more typical just to focus a laser or an LED in a small volume of that sample in what's referred to just simply as a single pass arrangement. Now there are advantages and disadvantages of these two approaches. And one of the things, one of the downsides potentially with the low MV case is that you, you have the challenge of increasing the active area of your sensor. What that means is you need a homogeneous RF and bias magnetic field across uh, the volume that you're using. The other critical thing that I need to get across is this idea that the coherence time is related and dependent on the amount of nitrogen that is present in the material and also the amount of carbon-13. Now carbon-13 uh, has a nuclear spin so it also acts to dephase MV centers. And this is the plot that has been lurking on the right hand side of uh, this slide. This shows the dependence between nitrogen and the coherence time with different abundances of carbon-13. Now we can use this to pick out areas of interest in terms of developing a uh, MV containing diamond material. Now in the single MV case for electronic grade or ELCBD, we obviously sit here in terms of nitrogen concentration. What I'm going to focus on are two target levels of nitrogen in the material that we've been developing. One exists around one part per million nitrogen, which is a logical concentration to choose because in the natural abundance case, this is the maximum concentration that we can use before this uh, coherence time starts to drop off. And then the other target that I'll focus on is around 10 ppm of nitrogen, where Again, it's reasonably favorable in natural abundance, but we can start looking at whether there's other ways of us recovering the coherence time that we've otherwise lost by increasing the nitrogen concentration. So before going into the details on the material development that we've been undergoing, I just want to give you a flavor of the breadth of applications that MV and Diamond uh, uh, touches. And I'm happy to share this slide uh, to anybody who's interested because it, it nicely lists all the papers that uh, display these fundamental demonstrations. Now later on I'm going to give a couple of case studies on bulk magnetometry but at the moment I just want to focus on a couple of other nice uh, examples that I particularly uh, like. So one is in the the field of wide field magnetic magnetometry. So here we're not only using the potentially high sensitivity of magnetic fields to uh, with MV centers, but we're also using the spatial resolution that an MV based system can deliver. And this is a very nice paper uh, from uh, Roger Fu and collaborators at uh, Harvard University, some of our collaborators, where they've taken a diamond based MV microscope that they've developed uh, with our material and imaged, believe it or not, uh, meteorites. So really they're using this to probe the magnetic field signature of the early stages of our solar system. And what I'm illustrating in the top right here is the comparison between 
what you observe in this sample using a conventional squid that we've already heard uh, a lot about in previous talks today, compared to their uh, diamond-based uh, MV um, wide field imaging system. And the, the difference is quite remarkable in terms of spatial resolution. Then the other emerging application that I think we'll hear more about in the years to come is this idea of a diamond-based maser, which is at the bottom of this uh, slide. So this is the microwave equivalent of a, a laser. And this is work and, and experimental demonstrations that have been done by the uh, group at Imperial College uh, London. Um, so again, this is an area that I think will be very active in development in the forthcoming years. So now I want to talk about the development work that we've been doing in terms of the material that we can uh, deliver uh, to the community and our industrial collaborators. So what we've been doing most recently is trying to uh, develop products that we can sell to interested people that really repeats the, the paradigm of the early stages with electronic grade, i.e. start to introduce to market some diamond materials that contain higher concentrations of MV centers to take advantage of some of the possible applications that I've been discussing. So we're doing this by launching a number of uh, diamond materials under the banner of the Diamond MV or DNV series. So again, the idea here is just really to increase the availability of this uh, material. So Carl, early on in the, the keynote talk at the start of today's session, put it quite nicely in terms of this concept of a quantum supply chain. So what we're trying to do is really ensure that at the fundamental material level, the supply chain is more assured and we can really um, nurture this emerging uh, application area and seed the market, if you like. So as part of this, the first material that we've delivered under the DMV series was what we refer to as DMV B1. So this corresponds to a material that contains around one part per million nitrogen. We launched this uh, back in June last year. Now this material um, has the properties that you would expect, given the plot that I presented on the previous term, uh, slide in terms of coherence time. Um, and you very readily, when exciting it with a green LED or laser, see red luminescence. So you very readily have a, a general purpose uh, solution to really start doing some of these experiments and developing your own magnetic uh, field or other sort of sensor uh, with MV centers in diamond. And this little video playing in the top right is an example of the red luminescence that you see in this grade of material when you pump it with a suitable uh, green light source. So one of the things that we're particularly proud of in the team is that this, this material and this product was uh, awarded the SPIE uh, PRISM Award in the field of quantum. So this has really encouraged us and given us some further uh, reasons to increase the number of products that we've got within the DMV series and hopefully continue uh, this story. So at the same time, as mentioned in the earlier slide, we've been working on higher nitrogen containing materials at around 10 parts per million. Now this is typically a really challenging area for people to grow nice uh, diamond uh, samples. And this is really because you need to control the presence of what I'm gonna introduce as parasitic uh, defects that can affect the coherence time and contrast. You also need to uh, achieve reproducibility between the samples and control strain in the diamond material, which I'll explain uh, shortly. And that's also detrimental to coherence time. So if we think about parasitic defects, it's most easy to introduce by illustrating what typically happens when you increase the amount of nitrogen in a uh, CBD diamond sample. And this is what I show here. Instead of having a nice colorless diamond sample, what typically happens is the diamond becomes brown as we start to increase the amount of nitrogen present in this material. So this isn't because of the incorporation of nitrogen itself, it's by the presence of other, uh, in some cases, nitrogen related defects, such as the nitrogen vacancy hydrogen center in this uh, material, and also things like vacancy clusters that can form. It's a combination of these two things that erode the optical properties of the material. 
Now, MVH minus, for example, is also paramagnetic. So very clearly the presence of these sort of defects can have a dephasing effect on the, the diamond and reduce the performance of uh, the material. The other obvious point is that if a material becomes less optically uh, transmissive in the optical, we're gonna start uh, absorbing some of the laser light that we're using to excite the luminescence or potentially absorb the, the luminescence uh, generated within the bulk of the diamond sample itself. So this is really critical to, to minimize if we can. We want to increase the amount of nitrogen in the material, but not at the expense of these sort of properties. And then I mentioned strain. So this is an example of what we see if we don't control strain in this sort of grade of material. What I show here is a optical biofringence image in the first instance, where we can see regions of high and low biofringence, which is a proxy to the strain in the material. Now, what we've done with our collaborators at Harvard is then map out what the coherence time is in different regions of this sample. And we can erode the coherence time very easily by a factor of three. Um, so this will have a, a majorly detrimental effect on the performance and sensitivity of this sort of uh, piece of diamond for sensing applications. And this particular example, the, the rough rule of thumb that we see is that biofringence in excess of 10 to the minus five has a significant effect on that coherence time T2 star in this particular type of material. So we need to clearly control that. So I don't need to dwell too much on the uh, development process that we undergo. It's fairly uh, self-explanatory, but essentially we would take our target specification for the diamond material. In this case, I'm talking about material with around 10 parts per million nitrogen. We would grow, grow uh, bulk or sometimes thin layers of that material, processing to uh, material that we can then very carefully characterize and then feed that back into the, the loop. And really it's the characterization stage that is critical. We need to be measuring the right things uh, and sometimes using proxy techniques uh, that are faster than doing involved quantum uh, tests in a sensor. Um, but we need to do the right characterization to speed up this feedback loop. Now, once we're happy with that initial uh, material, we can fix the recipe and start growing bulk samples that we can uh, do further characterization or send to our collaborators for further study. So really in this study, what we focused on is three uh, main properties and three main areas, increasing the nitrogen concentration, but whilst controlling the parasitic defects that I've been discussing, obviously crucially reducing and controlling strain in these very high nitrogen concentration materials. And then as I've uh, remarked, really using characterization approaches that allow fast uh, feedback of this process. So as part of this study, we commenced an initial exploration of all those levers that I explained earlier that we have at our disposal during the CBD growth process. And to begin with, we grew relatively thin layers of this material on uh, moderately pure um, CBD uh, substrates. Now through that study, what we were able to do is find a range of conditions that actually allowed us to grow diamond containing higher nitrogen concentrations, whilst at the same time actually reducing the amount of parasitic defects that are present. That's what I illustrate in the center of this slide. We can see that actually as we move from left to right, our nitrogen concentration in the material goes up, but clearly the, the amount of discoloration of the sample, which we're using as a proxy to the content of parasitic, potentially paramagnetic uh, defects, this goes down. So we've produced a, a high nitrogen containing uh, material that has a lower concentration of parasitic defects. This is exactly what we want and what we were after in terms of developing this sort of diamond material. So really the message here is that high nitrogen CBD doesn't necessarily lead to an increased level of parasitic defects. We can control that. So with that initial result at our disposal, we started looking at the reproducibility of uh, this process and this uh, particular uh, recipe. So for this, we produced a batch of material and assessed the consistency of the, the critical nitrogen concentration prior to irradiation and annealing, which again is the process that we're gonna to use to transform this initially present substitutional nitrogen bath to MV centers. Now, what we found in this initial uh, batch of samples is that we, 
we had good control of the nitrogen concentration between samples, an average at around uh, 13 parts per million, so pretty close to the level of 10 ppm that we were originally envisaging, with a very small scatter between samples. So it looked very positive. And the, the technique that we use to make these measurements is uh, simply absorption spectroscopy, um, UVVIS absorption spectroscopy. And really, there's a wealth of information that we can get by this spectroscopic technique over and above just simply the amount of nitrogen. So it's really by probing this spectrum in further detail that we can gain a greater insight in exactly uh, the, the purity of this material in terms of both nitrogen and parasitic uh, defects. So clearly from these initial results, we have good control of nitrogen across a batch of material. But then what we had to be concerned with was, did we have good control of vacancies that we were dosing via electron irradiation that would ultimately give us a consistent NV concentration in the final material? So we looked at the control uh, during electron irradiation. And to begin with, we simply mapped out the amount of uh, GR1, as it's known, um, which is a just an isolated vacancy defect in diamond as a function of our irradiation dose. And this just corresponds to irradiating the diamond sample for a, for a longer uh, time. And in the case of increasing GR1 concentrations, what happens is our diamond becomes increasingly uh, green. So we could then use this map to uh, choose a suitable level of irradiation to create the desired level of MV centers in our material. And the second thing that we looked at was the how reproducible the vacancy dose was. And we looked at this over a period of 12 months uh, in different irradiation runs, and it varied by less than 4%. So again, the news is fairly good, we would expect in terms of the reproducibility of this material. So from the last two slides, we have this combination of good properties in terms of small variation of the vacancy dose, which gives us control of the MV concentration. There's a small variation in the nitrogen content in this material. And ultimately what this is important for is controlling the fraction of those MV centers that we've created that are negatively charged. We actually need some residual uh, substitutional nitrogen in our diamond to donate an electron to turn MV from an otherwise neutral uh, charge state to a negative charge state. So control and the small variation of substitutional nitrogen in the material will give us control of that charge state balance, which is the critical metric that we introduced earlier in terms of the contrast in the device. So then we can put all of that together and look at how uh, reproducible the final MV concentration is in our diamond material. And that's the plot that I show on this slide, again, looking at a batch of material. So we can look at the different charge states of MV and individually quantify those concentrations. And again, we see a very small variation in, in MV concentration between these samples. So reproducibility uh, was good. So essentially the story from the last few slides is that through combined material irradiation and annealing control, we can produce material with MV concentrations and charge balances that are very reproducible uh, between samples, which is ultimately what is needed when we start launching a new uh, product to market. So I want to just briefly show you what these samples look like because they're, they're, they're quite nice um, looking. One of the byproducts of improving and reducing the amount of parasitic defects is that we, we have a, a more a vivid uh, color and this vivid purple color that you can see only comes about because of the, the few parts per million concentration of MV centers, and comparatively high concentration compared to what we were talking about at the start of this presentation, where we were literally just talking about one MV center, is those MV centers that give that very characteristic and very pleasant uh, pu purple color. So this is a, uh, just a photo that I took of six example samples that are around one millimeter in thickness, around uh, three to four millimeters laterally uh, from a batch of samples in excess of 30 that we produced. So we talked about strain earlier, so we need to start looking at the strain in this material clearly to get an idea of whether it will be highly performing or not. So what I show here again is uh, optical biofringence images 
of this sort of diamond material. Uh, the good news is that the, the biofringence levels are at or below that critical 10 to the minus five level that we identified earlier as being detrimental to the coherence time. So optical biofringence gives us an initial suggestion that this material would be uh, very uh, highly performing. But what is particularly nice is our collaborators, again at um, Harvard uh, University, the Wallsworth Group, have actually developed new techniques to use the MV centers in diamond uh, themselves to actually map out the, the strain and the shift in the resonance lines of the MV centers that's induced through the presence of strain. That's the, the map that I illustrate uh, here. And the strain shifts that they found are be well below the, the line width that you would observe for this sort of MV uh, center concentration. So it's another way of saying that the, the presence and level of strain in this material is by no way uh, at a level high enough to detrimentally affect the coherence time in this material. So the hopefully the message that I've got across here is the developed uh, synthesis me methodologies have demonstrated low and controllable strain levels. So we can put all of that together now and start measuring the critical uh, coherence time metrics for, for this uh, material. We've done this by looking at both natural abundance in terms of carbon-13 isotopes, so that's 1.1% abundant, as well as special material that we've grown where we've deliberately depleted the level of uh, carbon-13 present in that uh, material. And then the, uh, the Wallsworth group have performed standard but recognised Ramsey uh, technique measurements of this uh, material. So what we found in the natural abundance case is that we see a coherence time of around 400 uh, nanoseconds. This enables you to predict what you would expect the coherence time to be if you simply deplete the level of, um, uh, of carbon-13 present in this material, but don't have any other sources of decoherence, such as parasitic defects or uh, strain. And what you predict is a coherence time of 1.2 microseconds, which is remarkably close um, uh, and pleasantly surprisingly close to what we observe in, in practice in measurement of this sort of material when we've depleted the concentration of carbon-13. So what we've demonstrated is that we can achieve coherence times that are then competitive with that one ppm recipe that we introduced earlier um, by depleting the levels of carbon-12 in what is otherwise a a high concentration of MV centers. So in that sensitivity equation, we have this idea of the product of the MV concentration and T2 star affecting the sensitivity. And clearly in this sort of material, we have a very favorable uh, product. So we would expect this to translate into a high sensitivity in practice. So I now, in the remaining uh, time that I've got, want to focus on a couple of case studies where we've taken this sort of diamond material and worked uh, closely with a, another company um, to hopefully develop a diamond uh, based sensor technology in this area. Now the first company that we've worked with is, is Lockheed Martin. Now Lockheed Martin were interested a number of years ago uh, because they'd identified the fact that MV centers in diamond are a potentially very disruptive technology in the field of uh, magnetic uh, field sensing. At the same time, at Element 6, we've been working in this uh, space, as I remarked at the start, since 2007. So we've got a track record in this uh, area. So a collaboration between Lockheed Martin and Element 6 made a lot of sense. Lockheed Martin is also the perfect company for, for us to work with because our expertise is mainly focused at the moment at the, the fundamental uh, end of developing the material, developing some of the IP that goes alongside that. But a company such as Lockheed Martin bring a lot of expertise to the table in terms of the development and integration of a diamond sensor in a wider device. Now, initially the application scope for this sort of project was quite wide, but the, the area that was particularly focused on in the end is denied uh, GPS uh, navigation, which was a, a topic that we heard uh, earlier 
in this session uh, from Ollie, and uh, he explained the problem uh, very nicely. So I don't need to go into too much depth there. In that GPS is not a uh, inherently secure technology, and it's not a technology that you can rely on in all environments, even if you don't have a uh, adversary who's actively trying to, to block the signal. So in this case, what we're potentially trying to do is to use the small local variations that exist in the Earth's magnetic field from location to location to augment other nav navigation technologies with this additional level of uh, detail that is not reliant on uh, GPS. And again, the critical thing here is that Diamond MV based sensors deliver what is a true vector magnetometer solution compared to alternative approaches. It also has a very wide uh, dynamic range, in addition to the, the advantages that we've heard about before in terms of being able to operate at room temperature. So you don't need bulky cryogenic uh, equipment. So then ultimately, thanks to our diamond material that we've uh, that I've introduced, the high uh, MV concentration material that we've developed, lucky we're able to develop a fully mobile magnetometer test platform, which has really taken this idea of quantum sensing in magnetic field um, sensing from the lab bench into the real world. And this is the device uh, that they've put together and was also discussed in a, a nice uh, article in Wired back at the end of 2018. So re really the advantages here, as I've remarked, are the large dynamic range. Essentially, we can detect small changes in the, the magnetic field locally on top of the Earth's magnetic field without having to do any cancellation. And the, the sort of infrastructure and sense that they've built is designed to operate in a high shock and vi uh, vibration environment. And through further development of this technology, there is definitely the potential to deliver a uh, low size weight and power uh, solution. So it's, it's a very exciting uh, area of uh, development. So, in this uh, endeavor, we've actually taken Element 6 as a company, what is for us a fairly unusual step of taking the lead on writing an academic paper, discussing all these development efforts and the, the resulting diamond material. And the reason why we wanted to do this is to really get the message out there that diamond synthesis is now a mature technology. And again, the idea of this quantum supply chain, the material side is starting to become more assured. What we need as a community now is to build up the rest of the infrastructure around the diamond that's required to deliver a true uh, sensing solution, whether that be in magnetic field sensing, RF sensing, temperature sensing, uh, and all the other sensing modalities that were on the slide that I presented earlier. So through this paper, hopefully the message will um, uh, permeate through the community that there has been an awful lot of development in recent history in this diamond material and the diamond material is hopefully ready to support whatever ideas and whatever uh, innovations uh, can be generated outside of element six. And then very briefly to give you an introduction on some of the other areas in magnetic field uh, sensing. We're also working with a, a Canadian a startup company called SBQ Quantum. Now, in the uh, realm of uh, mining, it's very common even now to use uh, squids for tensor gradiometry to try and find new to, uh, suitable new sites for mining. However, as we've heard before, squid based systems have a number of limitations. It's inherently bulky technology because you've got all this cryogenics uh, that go alongside of it. And this is particularly difficult in, to handle in remote locations. So in the case of diamond magnetometers, we have exactly the same benefits that we've discussed on the last slide in terms of having that intrinsic vector capability when we have an ensemble of MV centers. But the further information that you can get by building uh, an MV sensor are things like the, the, the volume of material that you're dealing with, as well as the location and ultimately SB Quantum are looking to build diamond magnetometers into an array of uh, sensors to perform tensor gradiometry to ultimately provide a richer data set. Now, for anyone interested in further information on this, 
we put together a nice uh, case study between us and SB Quantum that you can find on Element 6's uh, website. So that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. So to summarize and conclude what I've tried to get across today is that CVD Diamond is a powerful and we think really uniquely suitable material for, for certain quantum technologies. And then quantum sensing applications, particularly magnetic field sensing, utilizing MV sensors in Diamond are reaching a mature level. And it's up to us to really ensure that the material is ready to support these endeavors. And hopefully that's what we've done and that's what we've demonstrated today. Ultimately, I focused on the development that we've put towards scalable bulk recipes targeting different levels of nitrogen, ultimately MV concentration, that are suitable for different device configurations that end users might have in mind. We've introduced a new CVD uh, diamond grade, DMV uh, B1, um, which was the first commercially available diamond quantum solution really to support this market. And ultimately there exists a wide range of applications on the horizon, which we believe can really push the boundaries of existing quantum technology and hopefully unlock new markets and new possibilities for us all. So thank you very much uh, for listening and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Fantastic presentation. I'm afraid we're, we've run over a little bit. Um, the, the the platform will actually uh, uh, kick us off in a couple of minutes. We have uh, time for just one question. Um, a question from the audience. Uh, where where do the, the higher density of uh, NV centers uh, uh, appear? Is it in, in diamond volume, or close to the surface, or is it a random distribution? It's it's really up to up to us how we engineer that solution. So we can we can grow electronic grade diamond, but then uh, grow a small amount of high nitrogen containing material close to the surface. People have demonstrated a few nanometers of high nitrogen diamond uh, on top of an otherwise high purity diamond. And then you can electron irradiate and anneal that sort of material, and ultimately produce a thin layer of MVs uh, throughout uh, throughout that small. Uh, layer on top of a sample, or you can produce uh, bulk high MV samples that I've been talking about uh, today. So all, all those uh, ranges of possibilities are uh, able to be delivered. Uh, and finally, do you use isotopically pure C12 and N14? So we use, in this particular example, where we're trying to push the performance of this high nitrogen material, there are still gains to be made in coherence time by using isotopically enriched um, uh, carbon sources. So that's that's exactly what uh, we did. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Andrew. And uh, please do get in touch with Andrew directly if you have uh, further questions. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>